Huh? It's great to see all of you. I want to, um, I'm going to be talking about love today, and I'm going to be talking about it for a particular reason. I believe God uh, asked me to um, create something new, to try to get the world back thinking about, praying about love. And I truly believe that what the world needs now is love, and I don't think we understand what love's about. And I'm going to talk today about two kinds of love. And I think that uh, these two kinds of love are the kinds of love that we fall into. We're called to one, but sometimes we live with another. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the differences. And then I'm going to share with you uh, this new set of mysteries for the rosary, which I've called the Divine Love Mysteries. And I'm going to share that with you. In fact, we'll do an abbreviated version of praying the, the rosary at the end of the talk. So I'm going to take us uh, through that. Uh, but before I do, I want to um, read something to you. Mark, excuse me. Um, we have some people that are um, not from the Catholic faith. So maybe just a short snippet of what a rosary is. <laughs> it's Thank you for interrupting. A rosary, just a very quick snippet of what a rosary is. Rosary, by the way, I have to tell you something. The way I know that God speaks to me as he speaks to you is when I'm asked to do something that is outside of my comfort zone, <laughs> but is a good thing. I have prayed the rosary. In fact, about 30 years ago, I was asked to give a retreat to high school and middle-aged kids on the rosary, and I did. So when I was, I believe, asked to create a new set of mysteries for the rosary, I said, this has to be God, because this is a profound joke, because what do I know about the rosary? But... It was a rosary to pray about love. So what is a rosary? A rosary was uh, uh, something that was around, actually, praying with beads was something that was actually pre-Christ. People prayed with beads. They used beads as a way to count prayers. And then um, after Jesus came along and people started uh, becoming followers of the teachings of Jesus and the church began to grow, people took and adopted this praying with beads, and um, and had a variety of different prayers that they um, uh, associated with the beads when they prayed. And in about the 11 or 1200s is when it really started to come together as a prayer to Mary and incorporated prayers that had to do with remembrances or what they call mysteries of the life of Jesus. Some say that it was St. Dominic who really was responsible for pulling the rosary together, but there's no historical proof of that, and even the Dominicans don't claim it. So uh, it really wasn't until the 1500s that uh, we were, the Christians were at war with the Muslims, and a big battle was about, a big sea battle was about to ensue, and the Muslims were coming to take over a, a great portion of Europe. And the Pope told the Christian warriors, I want you to pray the rosary and offer your fighting this battle up to uh, Mary. And they were outnumbered, the Christians, by the Muslims in both ships and in personnel, sailors. And yet the Christians won and turned back the Muslims. And from that time in the 1500s, the rosary became a, a, a important part of the church. In fact, that pope actually created a feast day for the rosary, which uh, lives with us today. So those that don't know, the rosary is a, is a set of beads. And I'm going to show you some uh, uh, in a little bit that uh, my daughter and I made this week. And uh, we made these, and we're calling them the divine love rosaries that we made. And, uh, and I'll show those to you. Uh, but uh, the rosary is a set of beads that has uh, five groupings of, of uh, ten and, the, and for five different sets of mysteries. The typical in the church have been the, the joyful mysteries, the glorious mysteries, and the sorrowful mysteries. And each one of those sets of five mysteries tell the story of the life of Jesus. 
That, those three sets of mysteries have been around since the 1500s. Recently, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, Pope John Paul created another set called the Luminous Mysteries, or the Light Mysteries, the Miraculous Mysteries. All four groupings, or, or sets of mysteries, tell of the life of Jesus. What this new set that I was, I feel, uh, moved to create, the, the Divine Love Mysteries, don't tell of the life of Jesus, but tell of the thing that Jesus told us to do. All the, the other four tell us of different aspects of his life. What the divine love mysteries do is focus on what he said are the, is the most important thing for us to do as followers, as believers, is to love God and love each other. And so this set of mysteries gets us focusing on love and five different aspects or, uh, of love. So does that make sense? And so when you pray the rosary before, uh, as you do each decade, each grouping of ten, you would uh, uh, have a scripture reading, and we'll run through that at the end. Did that give a brief? Yes. <laughs> <Okay>. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good. <laughs> one night I had a wondrous dream. One set of pr footprints there was seen, the footprints of my precious Lord, but mine were not along the shore. But then some stranger prince appeared, and I asked the Lord, what have we here? Those prints are large and round and neat, but Lord, they are too big for feet. My child, he said in somber tones, for miles I carried you alone. I challenged you to walk in faith, but you refused and made me wait. You disobeyed, you would not grow, the walk of faith you would not know. So I got tired, I got fed up, and there I dropped you on your butt. <laughs> because in life there comes a time when one must fight and one must climb, when one must rise and take a stand, or leave their butt prints in the sand. <laughs> there you go. Welcome. <laughs> All right. Why did, why did God make women so beautiful? So men would fall in love with them. Why did he make women so dumb? So they, so they fall in love with men. <laughs> One of my childhood heroes was um, Bishop Fulton Sheen. And uh, he tells a story about being on a, a bus and overhearing two women, and one woman's commenting on the other woman's diamond ring, saying, oh, what a beautiful, gorgeous, big diamond ring that is. And the woman, Mrs. Plotnick, says, ah, but it comes with a curse. Like the Hope Diamond, it comes with a bad curse. And the woman said, what curse? And she said, Mr. Plotnick. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to talk today about love. My daughter, a lot of you have met my daughter, and uh, she asked me to say hello to you. And uh, thank you for all the opportunities that she's had to get to know you um, in the past. And schedules just wouldn't work out, uh, and, and uh, so she wasn't able to come. But she has asked me on numerous occasions, she says, Daddy, when you're there giving your talks, are you going to tell them that you love them? And I said, well, probably. Because she knows that the only reason I do this, that this is my uh, 37th year in ministry, the only reason I keep bouncing all over the country and parts of the world is because I love you. With all my heart, my mind, my body, my soul, I love you, each one of you. And each one of you, whether I met you before or I'm meeting you for the first time now, you're important to me in my heart, and you make me a better person just for knowing you. So I love you. Well, my daughter says to me, she says, well, you tell them that I love them more. <laughs> I said, excuse me? <laughs> what do you mean you love them more? She says, you tell them that I love them enough to share my daddy with them. <laughs> For years, when I give talks and we have questions and answers, I've stayed away from commenting on political issues or controversial issues, even though many times I'm asked questions about it. People try to suck me into talking about 
you know, those issues within the church or within the world. And I always give this answer, and it's a true answer, but I am also dodging uh, the controversy. My answer is, you know, that's a very good question. But I said, I'm focusing on the love God and love you part. And as soon as I get that figured out, then I'll worry about those other big things that exist in the world today. You know, I think that most of us know that we are called to love, that Jesus said that the two biggest, most important commandments are to love God and love each other. We know we're called to love as people who believe, as people who fall in love. We know that it's an important part of who we are, but I think we find it difficult. And so we choose to focus more on arguing and looking for controversies, looking for those things that give us an excuse to not do what we know we're supposed to do, which is the hard work, and I mean hard work, of loving. I'll speak today on two fundamental types of love. One is called divine love, and the other is called secular love. Now, interestingly, these two types of love almost mimic each other. We feel the same, whether we're experiencing or living within a secular love or a divine love. We have the same pangs, the same, the same feelings, the same uh, 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 emotions, the same pain. It's all the same. There's one difference and one very, very important difference. And I hope today to sell you on the idea of divine love as being the one that we should focus on. And that difference is in divine love, our focus is God who John tells us in the Gospels, God is love. And all love comes from God. So divine love uses God as the center and the core. And secular love is really more about the world. It's what feels good to me. And people who are believers can be living within secular love or divine love. And non-believers actually can be living within divine love or secular love. The difference is, is where the focus is. Is the focus on something that's stable, that doesn't change, that doesn't move God, or is it on the world? You see, within secular love, and the reason people can fall out of love or move on or treat people poorly in love, you know it's secular love because it's really more about me. I'm in love with you as long as it feels good to me. I'm in love with you as long as that relationship with you helps me. Whereas divine love is, this is what you do no matter what. This is what you're called to do because I, the one who created you, told you to do it. Does that make sense? There's a difference. Fulton Sheen one time said, he says, if you look at a Valentine heart, it's symmetrical. But if you look at a human heart, it looks like there's a piece missing. And he made the comment, he says, maybe the piece is missing because God kept it. God kept a little piece of each of our hearts just to hold us close to him. Isn't that a nice thought? Huh? We either believe that God is love and that our love for each other comes from God. And that we're to live with each other in love as God would have us live. Does that make sense? That's divine love. So what is love? It's one of the hardest questions to answer. Love is a choice. Like, by the way, is a reaction. You know, you taste something, you like it. You don't like it. You see something, you like it, you don't like it. It's a reaction. But love is a choice. It's of the will. Uh, you have to choose to love, to allow yourself to love. Because we know that when we truly love, we can be hurt. We're opening ourselves up. And if you don't allow yourself to open up and to be hurt, then you have to question whether you're loving. Does that make sense? Some have said love is the result of appreciating another's goodness. Or by focusing on the good, you can love almost anyone. Actions affect feelings. Love does not lead to giving, but giving does lead to love. One problem we have in English is we have one word for love. Love. I love God. I love monkeys. <laughs> I, I, I love cake. I love humidity so thick you can't breathe. <laughs> we have one word for love. 
The Greeks have five. Now, when I started in ministry in 1975, uh, I was taught, again from Sheen and others, that the Greeks had three words for love. And then I got into C.S. Lewis, and he said there are four. And then when I was preparing for um, putting together the divine love mysteries, I found a fifth. So the Greeks had actually five words for love, and I'll tell you what they are. The first is uh, epithumia, is the Greek word. Epithumia, it means a strong desire. So the Greeks would use this word when they would talk about a strong desire for something. Um, it many times, when you find its use in Scripture, it has a negative sense. It has to do with lust. It's that lust for the flesh. So when you read in Paul and you really you read in different um, uh, Scripture verses about lusting for the flesh and how it's bad, that word would be the epithemia uh, love. And that the second word is eros, which uh, uh, some of us know in our English word is erotic love. This is a love, it's a passionate love with sensual desire and longing. A third word is storie or storge, and that's a Greek word for affection. Affection. A third, or the fourth is philia, which we have Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And philia is a friendship kind of love. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about, uh, in one Bible verse, I'm going to share with you about um, where in one verse, both philia is used, and then the last one, the fifth one, which is agape or agape, which is uh, an unconditional or sacrificial love. Those are the five versions of, uh, five words they have for love. Now, so when you read, or if somebody's writing in Greek, when they want to get across the message of love, they have five different words to try to get across and, and make it clear what they're talking about. What kind? We have one. We have one. I love my wife. I love ice cream. Oh, what's more important? <laughs> How do you know? Are you lusting after ice cream? What's <laughs> yeah. 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 You have, <laughs> do you merely have affection for your wife? So words are important. And in Scripture, they use, from the original Greek, they use these different words uh, to get across the message of the kind of love that it's talking about in Scripture. And what's the opposite of love? Hey, you know, I don't, I don't think so. I don't th yeah, I think it's apathy. And the reason I think it's apathy is because um, love is giving everything. All thought, all desire, all emotion is tied up in love. Hate has emotions too. So I don't, I, I, I don't think it's the opposite. Apathy is a complete lack. They're dead to you. There's nothing there. I think apathy is a different. But some people think hate. And wh where does hate come from? Hmm? Lack of love? I'm going to suggest something to you that it comes from our parents, and it comes from our society. We aren't born to hate. If we believe that God is love and God created us, then we're created to love. So the fact that we learn to hate or act in hate, here's a song I'd, I'd like you to listen to. You've got to be taught to hate and fear. You've got to be taught from year to year. It's got to be drummed in your dear little ear. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught to be afraid of people whose eyes are oddly made and people whose skin is a different shade. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught before it's too late, before you or six, or seven, or eight, to hate all the people your relatives hate. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be carefully taught. And then 
Isn't that a powerful song? That's from. Does anyone know what that's from? South Pacific. South Pacific. And it's one of those. It's one of those songs that that no one remembers from South Pacific. And it's a beautiful song, and it's a poignant song. We're born loving, but we're taught to hate. That comes out of the world we're living in. Why should we be praying for love? Why do I believe God wants us to pray for love? Because he wants us to get back to what he created us as, a people of love. A Napoleon Bonaparte was asked once, when do you start teaching a child? At what age? And what do you think he said? He said 20 years before that child is born. When the mother is born. <clears throat> we teach people through from the day they're born things that take them away from God. And we don't even know it. Because we're so caught up in our, in our own world and what life thinks that <clears throat> tells us we should think uh, should be important, that we move away from what really is important, which is love. If God is love, then the opposite of love might be sin. If God is love, can atheists love? Of course they can. Of course they can. The difference is it changes. So here's a, the divine love versus secular love. Discussing St. Augustine's book, Confessions, which I recommend to you if you haven't read it, Pope Benedict explained that the work is based on one fundamental interpretation of history, the struggle between two loves, love of oneself, even to the point of showing indifference toward God, and love of God, even to the point of being indifferent toward oneself. Secular love, simply put, is love without God. If God is love, then how is it possible? Secular uh, spirituality refers to an adherence to spiritual ideology. Secular love is generally more about me. How does it make me feel? D divine love is more about connecting with the creator, the source of all love, and connecting with each other. We are taught that the only way we can truly connect with God is to connect with each other. We love, as this is from 1 John, we love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, but hates his brother, he's a liar. For whoever does not love a brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. This is the commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love one another. Let me um, give you an example. In secular love, there's been a lot of um, coming together of secular love and divine love, especially as our world becomes more and more secularized. And for example, when I was doing Google and researching love, one thing I discovered was many atheists and secularists are taking the Song of Songs, for example, and claiming it's in the Bible by mistake, because that really is a secular uh, book. And it shouldn't be in there. If you don't know the Song of Songs, let me read a piece from you. This is this verse in Scripture is called, Her Lover's Visit Remembered. The sound of my lover, here he comes, springing across the mountains, leaping across the hills. My lover is like a gazelle or a young stag. See, he is standing behind our wall, gazing through the windows, peering through the lattices. My lover speaks and says to me, Arise, my friend, my beautiful one, and come. Oh, that's beautiful. Song of Songs is a, is, is a book of love, of sensual love, of, of passionate love. And for people to imply and to say, as secularists and atheists are now saying, that that is not for Christians, that is not for Jews, that is not something that should be in the Bible because that's ours, is to deny what love really is. You see, we narrow our scope of love. The love that God has for us and the love that God gives us is all-encompassing. It goes from caring about one another, doing for one another, to the sexual, sensual relationships we have with each other. It crosses all spectrums. And for people to try to say, well, that it was a mistake, that shouldn't be there because that's not your love, that's our love, is someone who doesn't understand God's love. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Now I'm going to go to one of my favorite people right now, and he's going to make a point for us. <laughs> I, I love William Shakespeare. I started out as an actor doing Shakespeare, doing Shakespeare festivals. I love Shakespeare. And here's one of his sonnets. It's sonnet 116. 
Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it is an ever, listen to this, it is an ever fixed mark that looks on tempest and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. Love's not time's fool. Though rosy lips and cheeks within the bending sickle's compass come, listen to this, love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. If this be error and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. Now that's Shakespeare. And he's talking about divine love here. An ever fixed mark, that's God. Ever fixed not changing, not moving. That's why we who say we love one another, we should use God as our focal point. God as our, our sense of direction, because God doesn't change. God doesn't blow with the wind or with society. God remains constant. If we want to have constant love with each other, that doesn't mean getting along all the time, but, but a constant love to come back to. We use what Shakespeare calls that fixed mark. And here he's quoting, it sounds like, from Corinthians 1.13. But bears it out even to the edge of doom. Love never fails, huh? Love never fails. Shakespeare. This is what divine, why <clears throat> divine love is so important. Divine love gives us God, a fixed mark. Secular love provides a sliding scale. What makes me feel good today, what I find important today may change and be different tomorrow. Shakespeare also said, love all, trust a few, do no wrong. Cahill Gibran wrote, the power to love is God's greatest gift to man, for it never can be taken from the blessed one who loves. Love lies in the soul, not in the body, and like wine should stimulate our better self to welcome gifts of divine love. People don't need to believe to practice divine love, as I said, in the same way many believers fall to secular love. I believe divorces happen even with Christian people because one or the uh, or both left the focal point of divine love and started adapting secular love. What's good for me? What does society say? I want it to look like this because society says the relationship should look like this. God said, do it my way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Many denied, uh, by the way, just because someone doesn't believe in God doesn't mean God doesn't believe in them. Many denied Galileo his theories. In fact, the church at the time of Galileo labeled Galileo a heretic. Well, guess what? They found Galileo was right. And centuries after they found out he was right, they removed the label of heresy. <laughs> it took centuries to do it, but they finally did. Many denied the world was round. Remember that? No. Did that make the world square? So just because the world is saying, the secular world is saying there is no God, does that mean there is no God? And yet why are we believing it? Remember when the Brown book came out about uh, uh, the Vinci Code? Oh, yeah. All these churches I'm in and all the conferences I'm doing, during the time that book was real popular, people were asking questions and said, what do you think of this new book? What do you think about what was going on and Mary and Jesus? Ah, ah, ah. And, and I asked the question, I said, I said, let me ask you this. I said, you got two books. You got the Da Vinci Code, you got the Bible. <laughs> the Da Vinci Code at the very beginning, Brown writes at the preface, this isn't true. <laughs> this is a novel. <laughs> the Bible, which I'm going to talk about here in a second, the scripture has never been proven wrong. Mm -hmm. And yet you're choosing to go for the salacious mm -hmm. as opposed to the rock, that which is stable, Shakespeare's ever fixed mark. Why do we do that? Why do we gravitate toward the secular and, and, and move from the divine? In a marriage, you can have one, as I said, embracing secular and the other embracing denial. Um, now, that's, okay, what is love? Second is, why should we love? First, because God told us to love. And second, because the world needs it. Chaos around the world. 
One of the things I remember as a kid growing up, we all heard all the stories of Our Lady appearing at Fatima and Lourdes. And what did she say to do, for example, at, at Fatima? She said, pray for the conversion of Russia. Remember that? Pray for the conversion of Russia. Well, guess what? Russia at that time hadn't fallen yet. But these kids, these young kids, were prophesizing based on what they believed Mary said to them in a vision, and they ended up being right. And said, pray for the conversion, because she knew that they had to come back, that they were going to leave, focused on God. They were going to go into a, a much more secular, uh, the word we use today uh, in their frame would be communist. But there's chaos around the world today. Look what's happening around the world. Look at the fighting going on. Look what's happening in the Mideast. Look at, I mean, we're in the verge of war with, uh, with, with Israel and, and Iran. Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, it's, there's turmoil. There's turmoil in Northern Africa. There's turmoil. In this country alone, we, we have our politicians leading us. They can't even stop fighting with each other. We were talking about it uh, at, at breakfast today. You know, it used to be they'd fight during the elections, but then they'd come and they'd stand up for the best nature of the country and what the country needed. Now they've all dra drawn such lines in the sand that they're not doing what's right, and both of them are wrong. Both uh, both sides are bad. What's going to change things? What's going to make a difference? I've often told you in Retroby, you want to save the world, you do it one family at a time, and that's why you're my heroes, because that's what you're doing. You're saving it one family at a time. Let me add to that. You want to save the world? Let's start infusing the world with the love that God put into this world when God created the world. And the first, easiest, best way for us to do that is to start praying for it and asking others to pray for it. Do you believe prayer works? Absolutely. If you do, why aren't we doing it? Why aren't we praying? So why should we love? I told you. Third, how do we bring about love? By opening ourselves to others. The more we give, the more we love. The prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love. For it is in the giving that we receive. It is in the pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in the dying that we are born to eternal life. Scripture reminds us of the promises of God and the love of God. But do we focus on Scripture? I'm not going to ask you, but if I were to ask you how many of you read Scripture regularly, it's probably very few. And if I were to ask you how many of you have actually read the Scripture all the way through, it's probably even less. And yet the Scripture is our guidebook to what God wants us to do. I wrote this a few years ago, and it's called I Am Sacred Scripture. I'll give you a, a, a little idea. I Am Sacred Scripture. I was inspired by God. I was written over a period of 1,500 years by great believers in God. They range from kings to fishermen, but God is the author. I tell the story of God's promise to his people and the response of those people. I am God's letter to all creation. I am a historical book backed by archaeology. I'm a prophetic book that has lived up to all of its claims. I am 73 books, 46 Old Testament books, 27 New Testament books. I contain history, prophecy, poetry, and theology. I have made 668 prophecies. None have been proven false. No other book even comes close to me in the amount of evidence supporting me. I am the living word of God. No other book gives more insight to life, more hope for the future, or better direction to a relationship with God. I am a lived experience. I tell of life. I tell of death. I tell of feast. I tell of famine. I tell of victories. I tell of defeats. I tell of love. I tell of betrayal. I tell of the creation of the world. I tell of the end of the world. I encourage questions. I provide answers. I invoke challenges. I provide comfort. I change hearts. I change minds. I change lives. I tell the stories of Adam and Eve, Abram and Sarah. 
Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, Moses, and Joshua, Gideon, Samson, David, and Solomon, Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, and Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Nehemiah, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, Paul, Luke, and Timothy, to name a few. I am feared by many, and many have tried to destroy me, and yet I have survived for 4,000 years. More original copies of me exist than any other writing in history. I am now and have always been the best-selling book in the world. The world will always try to destroy and discredit me. The world will fail. The world will pass away. I will never pass away. I am the inspired word of God. I am sacred scripture. So we have that book. And all that I wrote there is true. And yet we want to leave it to default to the world. And God is saying, use me as that ever fixed mark. Come back to me. And the best way to come back to me is by going to Scripture. <laughs> scripture gives us ten. I found this on the Internet. I don't know who wrote it. I can't take credit for it. But ten ways to love according to the Bible. Listen without interrupting. From Proverb 18, he who answers before he hears, his is the folly and the shame. Next, speak without accusing, from James 1.19. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Next, give without sparing, Proverbs 21.26. All day long he craves for more, but the righteous give without sparing. Next, pray without ceasing. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. Next, answer without arguing. From Proverbs 17.1, better a dry crust with peace and quiet than a house full of feasting and strife. Next, share with pretend, without pretending. Ephesians 4.15. Uh, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is head, that is Christ. Next, enjoy without complaint. Philippians 2.14. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. Next, trust without wavering. Corinthians 13.7. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always preserves. Next, forgive without punishing. Colossians 3.13. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Lastly, promise without forgetting. Proverbs 13.12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. We know that we're supposed to pray. Some of us think that praying makes us weak. <clears throat> I'm here to tell you that praying is not a sign of weakness, but it is truly a measure of strength. That's how we connect with God. And either we believe in God and want to follow his commands, or we don't. There, uh, many have said, well, I simply don't know how to pray. Well, that brings us to the divine love mysteries. It's one way that we can pray, a format that we can choose to use to pray for love. Now, let me tell you how, I, how this came about and I developed it. How am I doing time -wise? You're fine. I am? An hour or more? <laughs> <laughs> I was in Lafayette, Louisiana. By the way, I talked about politics. At, at breakfast, I, I reminded myself of, remember Huey Long? Mm -hmm. yeah. Lafayette, Louisiana, he, or Louisiana, he was governor, right? <laughs> he had this great line. He said, uh, when I die... If I die, <laughs> I want to be buried in Louisiana so I can remain active in politics. <laughs> so I was at Lafayette, Louisiana for one of these, for a Retrovi enrichment retreat. It was their very first one uh, for the Retrovi community down there. And as I was leaving, I'm in the airport waiting on a plane. And that's when something hit me. Something said in my head and my heart, I need you to develop something on prayer. And something said rosary. 
And from I knew that it was something speaking to me saying, put something together so this world can start praying for, for love. And I immediately started thinking about it. All the way home on the plane, I'm taking notes. I'm writing notes. By the way, I've nicknamed this the Retrovite Rosary. <laughs> because I must have been spurred on by something that happened at the Enrichment Weekend, being with folks just like you, who I think you exemplify love as good or better than anybody else. Because a major part of love is forgiveness. And no one knows that better than Retrovite companies. Amen? Amen, brother. So... All good, I, now here's something that's important to me. I was raised to believe this, that all good ideas begin first in the mind of God. God then looks the world over for human dreamers and then matches his good idea with a human dreamer. Now, if you believe that and you get an idea that you think is of God and you think that it is good, can you turn it down? Can you say no to it? If you truly in your heart believe that God spoke to you as he did to, like from, to Moses from a bush burning, are you going to ignore it? No. I think we should take more seriously those senses we have if it's good. And especially, as I said, if it takes you out of uh, your comfort zone. Mother Teresa said none of us can do small things, only great things, um, only, only small things with great love. And that's what we're called to do. Yeah. Now, I was thinking on Monday morning of this week, I, w I woke up and I must have been in my night yeah, while I was asleep dreaming about this, this talk and, and this. And I was thinking, I, I should have a graphic to explain simply what I mean when I'm talking about divine love. And my daughter is real good in math. And so I've been, you know, I haven't been able to help her with homework since the third grade. <laughs> but I, I see her, I see her doing all these math equations. So this came to my mind. Divine love is love to the seventh power. Huh? Yeah. So this came to mind. I ran down to my office and I wrote this down. I, said, I like that. Love to the seventh power. That is a graphic to describe divine love. But then something was saying to me, wait a minute, didn't Peter say to Jesus when they were talking about forgiveness, he said, should we forgive seven times? By the way, do you know that biblically seven is the perfect number? That's what it meant. God created the world in seven days, the perfect amount of days, right? Not seven of our days, seven of God days, perfect amount of, of days. Seven is the perfect number uh, in in uh, a biblical sense. So Peter says to Jesus, so we should forgive seven times. And what does Jesus say to him? Seventy times. Seventy times. So I changed it. I said, divine love really is love 70 times seven is divine love. It's, it's love is love to the 70 times seven power. Huh? Mm -hmm. Means it's unlimited. It's the perfect amount. How long should we love? How deeply should we love? How much should we care for it? 70 times 7 times we should love. Does that make sense to you? All right. So I developed this set of mysteries. Now, there's five love mysteries, and they are these. Infinite love. And all this is available on my website, uh, too, as handouts. Infinite love is the first one. The second is enduring love. The third is God's love. The fourth is greatest love. And the fifth is Christian love. Can you do that one more time? Sure. Infinite love. Enduring love. God's love. Greatest love. And the fifth is Christian love. Now, I told you that my daughter came to me and said, Daddy, maybe we should create, make our own rosary. You know, I give away rosaries. This is the one I've used for years. I've always kept for when I go to funerals. It's a neat one made with string. You know, it's all these knots tied with string. I think it's kind of a nice, different to a rosary. So Haley's, my daughter, says to me, Daddy, let's make a rosary. So we went to a bead shop. 
And I said, you go find your beads, and I'll go find my beads, and we'll do it. So Haley went, and these are the beads she put together. And the one thing you're going to find in common here is at the center here is a heart. Okay. So this is what she put together. It's all the elements of the rosary, but she did this by hand. In fact, we were up till midnight, one in the morning, putting our rosaries together. Now, I did two. I did this, which is just a simple, straightforward. Again, it has the heart in the middle, right? And the cross. But this is the one I'm proudest of. I found these beads, and I don't know if you can see them from there. They're all hearts. Each each of the beads going up is a heart. Huh? Isn't that kind of neat? And then the heart in the middle. So anyway, what I'm going to do is take you through the five, and I'm going to try to do it um, quickly. We won't do the whole rosary. We'll just do the uh, the uh, Hail Marys, Our Father, Third, Glory Be. How's that sound? Okay, for each of the five. The rosary, and I wrote this, the rosary is a vehicle, um, to, to, uh, should be used as a vehicle to get the world praying for love. The existing mysteries prayed with the rosary, the joyful, sorrowful, glorious, and luminous mysteries all tell the story of Jesus. Together they bring us the life, death, resurrection of our Lord. The new divine love mysteries is a way to remind us of what Jesus has called the greatest commandments, to love God and to love each other. The Holy Scripture, from its original Greek, uses five words for love. Each word has its own purpose and definition. Praying for love is not a sign of weakness, but as I said, a measure of strength. Mary said at the wedding feast of Cana, do whatever he tells you. Mary also told the children of Lourdes and Fatima, listen to my son. How appropriate to use the prayer to Mary to remind people of what Jesus said. The divine love mysteries are a way to help us to fully embrace what Jesus means by love. What better way to pray the rosary, Mary's prayer, to bring us to a better understanding of love. After all, it was Mary who out of her love for God said yes and brought love into the world. Okay? So I know that um, you don't have uh, rosaries, but if any of you would like that know how to use it, would like to borrow, yeah, and pass it around. Anybody like this one's heavy. All right, I'm, I'm going to walk you through. The first, the, the first divine love mystery is called infinite love. The scripture verse for infinite love is this. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. And he may grant you in accord with the riches of his glory to be strengthened with the power through his spirit in the inner self. And that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you, rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the holy ones, what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know that the love of Christ, that to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all fullness of God. So how do we embrace infinite love? According to this scripture reading, respect for the creator who made us. Number two, allow Christ to dwell in our hearts. And number three, open ourselves to the fullness of God. With each of the mysteries, I've provided three reflections, and I'll read them off now, and the one thing that's in common with all of them is there's always three reflections, there are questions, the first one is for self, the second one is for couples, and the third is for family. So these are reflections that you would read after reading the scripture. You would think about it. If you're with your your spouse, if you're with your family, if you're with a group, you talk about the questions and then pray it. Uh, Here are the reflections. In what ways has your inner self been strengthened by the Holy Spirit? Number two, how are you as a couple grounded or rooted in each other's love and in the love of Christ? And three, how are you as a family filled with the fullness of God? Now I'm going to do ten Hail Marys and then an Our Father and a Glory Be, okay? I'll start, for those that don't know the rosary, I'll say the first half of it, of the Hail Mary, and then you finish. Yes? Yes. 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 Y
Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of death. Amen. The next, the second divine love mystery is enduring love. The scripture verse, if I speak in human and angelic tongues, but do not have love, I am a resounding gong or a clashing cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and comprehend all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith so as to move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away everything I own, and if I hand my body over so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love is not pompous. It is not inflated. It is not rude. It does not seek its own interests. It's not quick-tempered. It does not brood over injury. It does not rejoice over wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. So faith, hope, love remain. These three, but the greatest of these is love. 1 Corinthians 13. Now, how do we embrace enduring love? Be patient and kind to those around. Set our egos aside and rejoice in the truth. Reflections. These are the things to think about while we're praying to Hail Marys. One, how would you describe the qualities of love you see in yourself? Two, how would you describe the qualities of love you see in your loved one? Three, in what ways have the members of your family expressed their unique love to you? Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The next, the third mystery is God's love. Scripture. Uh, Beloved, let us love one another because love is of God. Everyone who loves is begotten by God and knows God. Whoever is without love does not know God, for God is love. In this way, the love of God was revealed to us. God sent his only son into the world so that we might have life through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as expiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also must love one another. No one has ever seen God, yet if we love one another, God remains in us, and his love is brought to perfection in us. How do we embrace God's love? We let God love us. We allow God to love us. Sometimes so many of us think that we're so bad or we've done so wrong that God could never love us or could never forgive us. Remind yourself that you are truly loved by God. No matter what you've done, no matter how you failed, how how you've fallen short, God sees through all that and loves you for who you are at your core. Allow God to love you. Remind yourself that the creator of all things touched you before you were even born and chose you for one purpose, according to Peter, and that's to proclaim the glory of the Son. Number two, let God's love shine through you. And number three, be an example of God's love for others. The reflections. One, how has God's love for you helped you to love others? Two, how does your partner's love for you bring out the best in you? Number three, how has the love of God been revealed through your family? Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The fourth is greatest love. Scripture. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. The second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. Matthew 22, 36, 40. How do we do this? We listen to God. By the way, the word commandment, teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? The Greek word that was used was more, when we think of commandment, we think of a rule. You know, but the word that they use is command, like a general barking out a command to, the, to his, uh, his army. It's, this is what you are to do. It isn't just, there's another rule. 
This is what you are to do. It's a command to us. So the, the way we embrace greatest love, listen to God, obey his commandments, and love yourself. Reflections. What does it mean to love yourself? Two. What does it mean to love each other with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind? Explain each. Three, what would your family see as its two greatest commandments? Be creative. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The fifth and final mystery is Christian love, the scripture. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to him, Simon Peter, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was distressed that he had said to him a third time, Do you love me? And said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my, my sheep. John 21, 15 through 17. Let me say something about these three loves. Remember earlier I said that I'm going to share with you two words? <clears throat> Jesus is saying here the first time, Simon Peter, son of John, do you love me? Do you agape me? Do you love me in a sacrificial sort of way? Yes? Mm -hmm. An unconditional sacrificial way. And Peter answers, Lord, you know I love you in a philia love, a friendship kind of way. And then Jesus asks again, Peter, do you love me in an agape? Do you love me in a sacrificial, unconditional way? And Peter again answers, I love you in a philia, a friendly, brotherly kind of way. Third time Jesus asks, Simon Peter, do you love me in a brotherly philia kind of way? <laughs> and then it says Peter was sad because maybe he thought Jesus gave up on him. And he said, yes, I love you in a philia, friendly kind of way. How do we embrace Christian love? First, we feed his lambs. Then we tend his sheep. And then we feed his sheep. The reflections. How have you met the needs of those around you? Number two. How does it make you feel and how do you respond when your spouse repeatedly questions you? <laughs> <laughs> three. In what practical ways does your family show its love for God? Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Now, many parts of the world, including in America, the rosary is prayed, and it's important. And number two, and even more important, I believe God told me to do this for a reason. Huh? This is the first time I've done this with a group. Since I came up with this and I wrote these mysteries, I've done this every night. And that God wants us to pray for love. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so because of that, I share this with you. Now, I live in a little town called Alpine. We have a lot of critters. I have two dogs. I used to have horses. And it's in the, it's in the foothills. And we have a lot of dogs in our neighborhood. We have a lot of rabbits. We have a lot of, of, of snakes. We have a lot of everything. One year alone in my yard, eight rattlesnakes. Wow. Oh so God. it's just, it's country, you know. So that's why I'm dogs. Let them get bit. <laughs> <laughs> Never have. I've always had two dogs. And here's what I learned with rattlesnakes anyway. With two dogs, they find it. They somehow let the other know, hey, I smell something. They find it. And the, the rattlesnake will, will uh, come up and rattle. But because there's two of them, I, I believe that this is true. Because there's two of them, the rattlesnake won't strike for fear that the other one, the other dog will get it. Mm -hmm. And so because I've always had two dogs, thank God, none of them have ever been bitten. And they keep cornering these rattlesnakes, so, which is good because Haley hasn't been bit, thanks to the dog. So, uh, in fact, once Haley was walking through the backyard and the dog 
and I have just little cocker spaniels. They came and literally tripped Haley out of the way because there was a rattlesnake there that they just discovered. So yeah, they're good dogs. I'd move. <laughs> I know you don't. You don't have anything here. Uh, hurricanes, alligators, snakes. 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 I, I was telling people in January. I was in Tampa at a retreat uh, center there. And it is gorgeous, like a resort. Yeah. It is Bethany absolutely Center. beautiful. What is it called? You're at the Bethany Center. Bethany Center. And it's got a huge pond, a huge lake. It's yeah. gorgeous. Oh, no. But these signs, don't go near the lake. <laughs> <laughs> alligators. <laughs> so God forbid you want to go. And let me tell you something. Alligators are bigger than rattlesnakes. <laughs> <laughs> so you know what I say to you? Move. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we've got we've got a lot of uh, rabbits and a lot of dogs. Have you ever noticed when a dog senses a rabbit, the the ears go up? Well, with cockers they kind of flop up, <laughs> and the tail starts to wag, and they start to bark. Right, and if they can get out of the yard, what do they do? They chase after the rabbit. Well, what do the other dogs do? They start barking. And if they can get out of their yard, they start running and chasing after the rabbit. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Pretty soon you can have seven, eight dogs all running down the street chasing after this one rabbit. What's interesting, if you ever see it, watch this. The dogs will start to leave and go home. The first dogs to leave and go home will be the last ones to join in. Mm -hmm. Then the second to the last. Then the third to the last. Pretty soon you only have one dog left chasing that rabbit. You know what dog it is? The first one. And do you know why? He's the only one that saw the rabbit. All the rest of them just sort of got caught up in the excitement. Why do you go to church? Do you go to church because you got caught up in your friends do it? You were raised that way? Or because you saw the rabbit? Because God is real to you. Because when God has created in you is real to you because the love that God is and that God put into each of us from before we were born is real to you. Ask yourselves, have you seen the rabbit? Amen. Amen. Okay, divine love is God's gift of himself to us. Accept his gift, embrace his gift, share his gift because love changes everything.